Going back to 1977, Harrison Ford introduced a figure by the name of Han Solo to the world. And almost instantly an iconic character was created. Fans apparently had next to no interest in seeing an origin story in which Harrison Ford had no involvement, however. Instead, the Alden Ehrenreich-led movie by the name of Solo A Star Wars Story flopped hard. Coming in with just under $400,000 at the box office, with the vast majority of people never bothering to see it at all. This is a bit of a shame to be honest, as the movie isn't actually a bad one by any stretch, and there are some fantastic details to be seen, albeit with arguably a few too many forced fan service moments along the way. But either way, I am Gareth from What Culture Star Wars, and here are 20 things you somehow missed in Solo A Star Wars Story. Number 20, the opening wasn't set in space. That's right, of the 11 live action Star Wars movies to date, the scene which involves Han in his speeder coming back to Lady Proxima makes Solo the sole Star Wars movie not to begin in outer space. They don't call it Star Wars for nothing, you know. It is a small detail and one that doesn't particularly impact too much, it must be said, but it at least gives Solo something of a uniqueness even if just for how the whole spin-off tale begins. Number 19, Crimson Dawn was name dropped early. Though the details are a little sketchy, thanks to a three year time jump, Han's love goes from being trapped on Corellia to being one of Dryden Voss's most trusted advisors. The vicious leader of the Crimson Dawn was notoriously ruthless, as were the group themselves, and were on Kira's radar well before she ultimately joined them. As they were queuing to leave the planet, she warned Han of a life without the Empire's protection, and of the risk of being sold to either the Hut Cartel or Crimson Dawn. Turns out that the latter were a danger even without her leaving the planet, and that was telegraphed within the first 10 minutes of the movie. Number 18, The Pikes. The opening words of Solo, a Star Wars story, painted the picture of a lawless galaxy, and the likes of Crimson Dawn and the Huts were able to thrive in this environment. Then there were the Pikes, gangsters that controlled the spice mines on Kessel. Solo was the first time such characters were seen in live action in the Star Wars universe. Though they appeared numerous times through the Clone Wars, easily the biggest storyline that involved the Pikes was the mystery of the mind behind the creation of the clone army Jedi Master sifo death. None of this was touched on in Solo, of course, so it would be easy to miss just how big a damn deal the Pike Syndicate actually was. Number 17, Tobias Beckett's Disguise. As a smuggler, it's to be expected that Lando Carrissian would have his ways of avoiding being recognized. When infiltrating Jabba's palace in an effort to free Luke Skywalker from a date with the Sarlacc in Return of the Jedi, Lando of course suited up in a disguise that covered most of his handsome face. And in a lovely callback to the original trilogy, Tobias Beckett wore the exact same outfit during the heist on Kessel in Solo. Stored in the Millennium Falcon, it was again there for Lando all those years later. Number Number 16, Teras Cassie. In those three years separated from her beloved Han Solo, Kira was taken by Crimson Dawn and under the wing of their intimidating leader, Dryden Voss, and he went about training her as something of his second in command. This also entailed training in physical combat. Kira more than held her own during the fight on Kessel, and when asked what she was doing, she answered that Voss had taught her Teras Cassie. This is an incredibly deep cut reference to the gaming side of the Star Wars universe. Way back in 1997, when the Star Wars franchise consisted of just three movies, I know, what a world, LucasArts released Star Wars Masters of Terras Cassie on the PlayStation. The fighting game was notoriously bad, but was somehow remembered by the solo writers even all these years later. Number 15, a similar story to The Bad Batch. With the sequel trilogy and two anthology movies releasing within a five year stretch, as well as almost countless Disney Plus series either releasing or in the works, it's almost expected that some of these stories will be somewhat similar. Though not identical, there are themes and threads throughout certain narratives within the Star Wars universe that are ridiculously alike. And what do you know, this just so happened to happen with Solo and The Bad Batch. In the glorious animated Bad Batch series, it was a tactical droid head that that the titular unit initially fought Trace and Rafa for, before handing it over to them voluntarily. While Han Solo battled Enfys for the valuable coaxium, almost all movie long before allowing her to leave with the hyperfuel as a means of the greater good. Simply put, the tale of episode 6 of The Bad Batch is eerily similar to this particular piece of Solo's story. Number 14, Anthony Daniels as Tack. C-3PO and R2-D2 have been involved in every Star Wars Skywalker saga movie, as well as Rogue One, though they were nowhere to be seen in Solo. This could have meant that C-3PO actor Anthony Daniels appeared in all but
but one Star Wars movie so far. But in truth, that just is not the case. It is a very small blink and you'll miss it role, and that's if you can recognize Daniel's actual face rather than his usual droid mug, but the actor does appear in Solo as well, meaning that all 11 movies so far have featured him in some way or another. The character Daniel's played was called Tack, one of the slaves on Kessel who fought back after Han kickstarted a revolution on the planet. Number 13, Enfys Nest was a better Carly Morgenthau. Enfys Nest consistently hounded the crew's attempts to steal Coaxium in Solo, and was responsible for Han dumping the first lot, forcing them instead to heist raw Coaxium on Kessel. However, it was then confirmed that Enfys didn't want the hyperfuel for herself or to sell to the highest bidder. She genuinely wanted to make a difference against the Empire in the galaxy. Enfys was portrayed by Erin Kellyman, who three years later joined the Marvel Cinematic Universe as Carly Morgenthau in The Falcon and the Winter Soldier, and the character's motivation is very similar to that of Enfys. Both characters were living outside of the law, trying to have some effect on a ruling body that wasn't treating them right. There are major similarities between both could-be heroes, if they went about things in a slightly different way, only Enfys was far more successful. She actually did make some sort of difference, whereas Carly actively made things worse for herself. Number 12, Warwick Davis as Weasel. Despite playing the likes of Ewoks, Aliens, and an animated character in Star Wars Rebels, Warwick Davis's face has rarely been in the spotlight. Solo is one of the rare times, however, that his recognizable features are not obscured. There was no name given to his character while on screen, though he is confirmed to have played Weasel as part of Emphasis crew. It is reasonable to believe, then, that this must be connected to the only other time his face has been shown. Coming all the way back in The Phantom Menace when Davis was spotted watching the pod race, does this mean that this too was Weasel? The way Star Wars is churning out content now and moving into the future, there will probably be a Weasel Disney Plus series to tell his story soon enough. Number 11, I know. There has always been something of a love-hate relationship shared between Han Solo and Lando Calrissian, and the two had that very same dynamic going all the way back to when they first met. Lando liked the cocky kid, but as with most people, it was far too easy for Han to get on their bad side. This was a result of his general attitude, his arrogance, and of course getting Lando and the Falcon involved in the Kessel heist in the first place. When they landed on Severine, the Falcon, Lando's pride and joy, was battered and bruised, and as he and Han looked upon the damage to his beloved ship, he told his new friend that he hated him. The two-word response echoed arguably Han Solo's most famous and most iconic dialogue from the entire original trilogy. I know. Number 10, Fair and Square. Now, it must be said that most fans would argue that they didn't need a backstory behind every single word Han Solo said in the original trilogy, but that's essentially what they got in Solo, all the way down to the exact words he used in a disagreement with Lando on Cloud City. The friends slash rivals had always disputed who the rightful owner of the Millennium Falcon was, with Han specifically telling Lando that he wanted Fair and Square. But not just one game of Sabacc between the two was shown in the prequel, two were. The first, Lando cheated to win, but by the time of their rematch, the hero of the story had figured out how to get the better of his rival pal. This is why the words fair and square were so damn meaningful. When Lando first beats Han, it wasn't a fair game, so he made damn sure that the second one would be. Number 9, A Good Feeling you want more callbacks to famous references? Well, how about the movie taking one of the most famous Star Wars phrases and flipping it right on its head? Oh, well, hey! In the 10 other Star Wars movies, the phrase I've got a bad feeling about this or some variation has been spoken. Then there is Solo. You'd be forgiven for thinking that the phrase would absolutely be uttered as Han himself said it way back in A New Hope, but instead the iconic character took a different view of the situation. In fairness, in Solo, he was backing himself to navigate through a maelstrom that no other pilot possibly could. Good. And he was right to have a good feeling about this one after all. What a positive pilot, eh? Number 8, Mandalorian Armor. Star Wars Easter eggs can often be hidden in plain sight, in the background of a conversation or action piece that draws the focus, such as the details of Dryden Voss's office, for example. In the middle of the room, there is a full set of Mandalorian armor on display, and though many won't have noticed, as soon as you know it's there, you start asking some questions. Why in particular would Dryden Voss have such armor on show? Well, what if it was a nod to arguably one of the more surprising reveals of the entire movie? Fans of the Clone Wars have known for some time that Darth Maul didn't die at the hands of Obi-Wan Kenobi. Not in The Phantom Menace, at least. But the majority of mainstream solo movie-watching audiences would have had no idea. Fans of the show also would remember that a big part of the Sith Lord's arc saw him complete a successful hostile takeover of Mandalore itself. Could this armor have been a nod to the man Voss answered to only? For those diehard fans who would really know what it could mean? Possibly.
Number 7. A Dead Rebellion While on Kessel, the whole focus of the mission was to heist away enough raw coaxium to pay back Dryden Voss for the hyperfuel hand dumped to shake loose Emphis on his first mission with Tobias, Val, and Rio. However, it wouldn't have made for much of a story if it was this simple, right? The crew, in particular Han and Lando's droid L3, essentially sparked a mini-rebellion on the planet, as you do. However, while that is where the story ends for Kessel in Solo, as naturally the movie follows Han and Co once they leave the planet, there were still things that were going to go down on that planet afterwards. Namely, this rebellion against the Pikes was quashed, and the planet continued on pretty much as it had done before, using slaves to mine spice. This is all but confirmed in the opening story of Star Wars Rebels, a show that is set after Solo in the timeline. Ezra's first mission with the crew is to help a group of Wookiee slaves escape from the Empire. But where are they being taken as slaves? That's right, Kessel. This would have been impossible had the uprising actually been successful, but instead Han and Co essentially left the planet behind behind just as they found it, albeit a few vials of coaxium lighter. Number 6. Dryden Voss's Scars for almost a decade, Paul Bettany has portrayed Vision in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and it's fair to assume that in that span he has become accustomed to the use of prosthetics while shooting for the Avengers movies. For Solo, based on the scars that are one of the key features of Dryden Voss's face, you'd be forgiven for assuming that this was a similar process. However, that's not quite true, as the actor who brought the character to life wasn't even aware the scars would be there until after shooting had wrapped. Instead, he simply found out about his character's true post-CGI appearance when Ron Howard sent him a picture after the fact. Charming. Number 5. Bounty Hunters Bounty hunting seems to be a rather legitimate profession throughout the Star Wars universe. And though they may be the most famous to do it, there are obviously far more than just the likes of the Fets and Din Djarin. And there were two somewhat familiar hired killers referenced throughout Solo as it goes. When deciding whether or not to welcome Han and Chewie into their crew, Val suggested to Tobias that they bring in Bosk instead. A very minor character in Empire Strikes Back, you're far more likely to recognize the bounty hunter's lizard aesthetic rather than his name. Another to be referenced is Aura Singh, a bounty hunter who ran a crew with Bosk, as well as a still young Boba Fett in The Clone Wars. Number 4. An Indiana Jones Easter Egg In a setting such as Dryden Voss's office, with so much going on in the background in terms of display, it would almost be criminal to have just one Easter Egg, right? There are literally limitless Star Wars artifacts that could have been included, but Solo also opted for a detail from another franchise entirely. Harrison Ford had a career the likes of which few could hope to match, but there is no denying his two biggest and greatest roles. Both coming under the Lucasfilm banner, it made perfect sense to include a little nod to Harrison Ford's other iconic character in a film about Han Solo. The nod in question came when Beckett and Han first met Dryden Voss. With so much going on, you'd be forgiven for missing the golden idol from Raiders of the Lost Ark on the table behind them. That deserves a celebratory whip crack, I say. Number 3. Chewie Will Rip Your Arms Off of course, a prequel of this nature was always going to have strong connections to the movies it spun off from, but it genuinely seemed like every single hint to Han's backstory or dialogue between him and Lando was given even more context in this movie. This didn't stop with Han either, as of course alongside him was everyone's favourite Wookiee Chewbacca. There was even a callback to when Han's right-hand Wookiee first met C-3PO and R2-D2. Upon the Millennium Falcon in A New Hope, Chewie sat across the chessboard from R2-D2, who was roundly beating him. Han Han warned that his friend could pull an arm out of its socket if he lost. Later in Solo, a Star Wars story, during the heist of Kessel, Han and Chewie attacked their would-be guards. In spite of the fact the man's uniform would have fit Han perfectly, the Wookiee tore both his arms from his body, sleeves included. Without too much effort, to be honest. Turns out Han wasn't joking when he warned C-3PO about losing a limb or two. Number 2. John Favreau as Rio you could argue that no one has done more for Star Wars in recent years than Jon Favreau. However, even before his glorious Star Wars creations were released, Favreau played his part in Star Wars on screen rather than off it. His first Star Wars acting credit came when he voiced Pre Vizsla in The Clone Wars, fittingly a Mandalorian extremist and leader of Death Watch. In Solo, however, he played a much more light-hearted character who only appeared in a handful of scenes before being killed. When Han met Tobias Beckett, he joined a crew that also boasted Val and Rio, the latter being a CG Ardenium pilot. The thing is, Jon Favreau's voice is recognisable as the character, particularly to fans of the MCU, though not necessarily instantly, so he's easily missed during his brief appearance here. Number 1. Han Shot First 
In the Moss Eisley Cantina, where Han first meets Luke and Obi-Wan in A New Hope, he is confronted by Greedo trying to collect payment owed to Jabba the Hutt. Of course, the discussion goes very wrong very quickly for Greedo, as he is shot dead by Han. As you likely know by now, in the original movie, Han shot Greedo first. While edits were later made to show Greedo trying to shoot Han to give more of a suggestion of self-defense. This proved quite controversial and unpopular with some fans, but has since been referenced as a nod to those unhappy few in Solo. After Han and Beckett double-cross each other a few times, they have a standoff. But before the latter has a chance to do anything, Han shoots him, eliminating any threat of the reverse happening. This is absolute and undeniable proof that Han would shoot first to save himself, without risking waiting to see what his adversary would do first. So take that, George. Yeah. And that's our list of any other things that people somehow missed in Solo, a Star Wars story. Then let us know all about them in the comments section right down below, and do not forget to like, share, and click on that subscribe button while you're at it. Also, if you like this kind of thing, then please head on over to whatculture.com and find some more fantastic articles just like the one this video you're watching this very second is based on. I have been Padawan Gareth from What Culture Star Wars. Thank you very much for watching this lovely video today. May the Force be with you, and hopefully I see you very, very soon. Bye-bye.